on the Facebook feed. On the Facebook.com. Yeah. Yes. We got a lot of people listening online right now. And this afternoon, we are chilling in the building with the man himself, Mr. Ashney Singh. Yes, Minister of Finance. Yes, yes, yes. I feel very yes. honored that he took his time our to time. come, our time, yeah, and yeah. his time to come this is the visit man. us. This is the, the man. Yeah, exactly. I'm rubbing my hands together because I'm around money, you understand? <laughs> Big, <laughs> How wow. are you, Mr. Singh? Good afternoon to you. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much, Casual and Remix. It's great to be on your program. It's uh, it's not the usual format that I'm accustomed <laughs> to, but it's fantastic to be with you this afternoon. Yeah. And that's exactly why we wanted you on, because we know that this is not the format you're used to, but you are willing to come on. Uh -huh. You're willing to talk about the budget, because, you know, everybody's talking about money, money, money. Man, so that is, is the subject. Is, yeah, that is the is. subject. Over the next week, I guess they're going to be reading and understanding what you've put forward in the budget. Yes. And the following week, they're going to start, you know, shooting all these fast-paced questions at you as to why and what and what you're going to do with and all that kind of stuff as to what happens with the budget. Right. But for people like me that really have no financial background and I just live here, what does the budget mean for Guyanese? Sure. So I'm really glad. I'm really glad that you have invited me, and I'm really glad to be on the program because, like you said, this is a slightly it's 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 a it's a format that I don't do very often. It's different for you. But but yeah. but but you have a huge audience and a huge audience to whom the budget really does matter, even if it's not immediately obvious. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do I mean by this? You're absolutely right, casual. That I presented the budget last week. We're going, last Friday, we're going to be debating the budget probably for the next two weeks or so. So it's going to be in the news. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the obvious question is why does the budget matter to people? Well, I mean, is, is this just something, is the budget something that only economists sitting at the Ministry of Finance or politicians sitting in the parliament uh, might be interested in? Or is it something that matters to people? Mm -hmm. And the truth is that the budget really, really is something that aff literally affects and influences the lives of every single Guyanese, for every single person living in the country. Right. In one way or another. And so it's really important that people understand why this matters. Okay. Right. So what, what, what does the budget have? Or what is the budget about? The budget essentially is um, a, a, a summary of the economic policies of the government. So the policies that the government is proposing to implement, or the government has adopted, that it will be implementing over the course of the next five years, and in a, over the shorter term horizon over the next year. Okay. And so policies, programs, projects, initiatives that the government will be implementing in literally every aspect of life. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that we are all, each one of us, we're all living and working in Guyana, the same things matter pretty much to all of us. Quality of life, our ability to work, our ability to earn, our ability to set up a business, for that business to grow, for that business to do well. Those things matter to each and every one of us. They matter to the person running a big business. They matter to the person running a big company. They matter to a person... Uh, living in Bartica. A, living in Bartica. Mm -hmm. They matter to a person living in a village in Region 1. Mm -hmm. They matter to a person who is now a young person thinking about setting up their own business. And so the economic environment that the, that the government creates really literally does translate into the well-being, the comfort and well-being of every single person. Mm -hmm. okay. The extent to which you're able to set up a business and the extent to which your business is able to grow and to make money and to do well literally depends on the government's economic policies. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the budget always matters. The budget really does matter to people. And in terms of the quality of life things, the budget provides money to build, the, build out the infrastructure in the country. Uh, the budget provides money to provide social services, pu uh, public health care, education, the education that our children mm -hmm. uh, will benefit from, uh, the quality of social services that we enjoy, uh, the quality of roads on which we drive or on which we walk, the, uh, our ability to travel more easily to other parts of the country. So l literally every facet of our life, every aspect of our life is mm -hmm. affected by the, the, budget. The, the budget. And so <clears throat> it's really important that people understand this. It's really important that the budget we have put together um, is a budget that is designed to ensure that the economy grows, resumes its growth path. And a growing economy is important because a growing economy means that there are opportunities for businesses to be established, for businesses to grow, for businesses to make money. 
which in turn means that it's an opportunity for people to do well, for mm -hmm. people increasingly to be more comfortable. And so that's what this budget, our budget, the budget that I just tabled in Parliament on, on the government's behalf, that's what this budget is about, creating an environment that is favourable to investors coming into Guyana, local investors setting up their businesses and growing their businesses, mm -hmm. creating jobs, generating incomes, and essentially creating the conditions for life for all of us to enjoy a better quality of life going forward. You've, That's tabled, what the is about. you've tabled a projected growth on the budget. Um, it's, a, it's a fair number, 29? 20 20, 20.9. 20, 20. 20. 20.9, 20. yes. Now, 20.9 is, is, is welcomed right now because we, we, we need to see ourselves heading in, in the right direction in a positive mm -hmm. number going up. Now, when you sit and you... I guess you have to have a very quiet space <laughs> because when you sit and you put together the figures and you realize, hey, we're going to see some development in this sector and this is going to cause the country to be better and well more recognized on the world market mm -hmm. and more, I guess, more marketable to the rest of the world. How does that um, translate into a number like 20.9? And then also, how does it translate to a number like three hundred eighty-three point one billion dollars? Sure, sure, yes. Sure. And so that's that's seven hundred fifty thousand people. Sure. Yeah, so, 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 so what does the twenty point nine represent? Yes. yes. The twenty point nine essentially represents what we call real GDP growth, real growth in the gross domestic product of the country, growth okay. in the aggregate out, output of the country. Okay. And so that represents essentially what we anticipate to be the growth in aggregate output in total output in oil and gas now that we're an oil and gas producer in the traditional sectors of the economy like agriculture sugar rice bauxite other crops in services things like uh, construction uh, entertainment mm -hmm. hospitality and tour tourism and hospitality um, uh, financial services like banking and insurance so Total growth in the economy essentially represents an aggregate, an aggregation of the growth in, in output in the country, what, what you would call growth in value added output in the country, mm -hmm. to use a technical term. But it essentially means, and I mean, your, your listeners would hear constantly, they turn on the news, they'd hear about growth in the economies around the world, they would hear about recessions, they know what recessions mean. An economy that is in recession is an economy that is contracting, is, is recording negative growth in successive periods over time. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. An economy that is growing is an economy that is expanding, that is producing more, that is investing more, that people are able to consume more. So a growing economy is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. And the number represents, like I said, an aggregation of growth in the various sectors. So to give you a sense, we are projecting 20.9% growth in Guyana. In the, in the economy as a whole, which includes oil, so, in the non-oil economy, mm -hmm. so if we exclude oil, and we, the reason why we exclude oil is because, of course, oil is new. such, it, it's new, exactly. So if you're looking at growth from one year to the next, considering that we are a new oil producer, the oil number has a big influence on overall growth. If you took oil out, we're projecting that the economy will grow by 6.1% this year, so the non-oil economy which is a very, very respectable... It's, it's still a very, a very it's solid a very, number. It's a very respectable growth rate. It's right. a, a big number. It's a very solid number. And considering that we're doing this in an environment where you still have COVID-19, where people are still constrained against going out and interacting freely, and you know, or, you know, you, you, you know quite, quite a lot of the sectors of the economy are still affected by COVID-19. Yes. You still have some COVID restrictions. Of course. And, and so on. So it's a very, very solid and respectable rate of growth that we're anticipating. And it represents a significant recovery from last year, which was a really challenging year. Yeah, we had a tough year. It was a bad year. It was mm -hmm. a bad year, as you know, for many reasons. And then, uh, Remix, you asked the question about the growth. The 383.1 uh, billion. So, so that, yeah. that is the size of the budget. And that's essentially total projected government expenditure. So you have government expenditure across all of the sectors, expenditure on public sector wages, expenditure on uh, goods and services to be purchased by government, uh, expenditure to be incurred on public investments, things like the roads that we will build, we will build the schools that we will build, the hospitals that we will build, the um, health centers that we will build, the ICT infrastructure that we will put in place. So that 383.1 represents 
total projected government expenditure in 2021. Okay, right. excellent. So in terms of, let's just break it down then, because I read that there's now going to be $60.6 billion for the education sector, which is very near and dear to my heart. So, and it's going to support the delivery of world-class education in Ghana. Tell us, how did you come up with that figure and what is that money going to be utilized for? Sure. So what that represents is what we'll be spending on education across the entire sector. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and we all want, all of us want our children or mm -hmm. our nieces and nephews or mm -hmm. neighbors' children to have a good quality education. That's what everybody wants. Of course. And if you're a young person, you want to be able to complete high school or you want to be able to complete university, do very well, yes. get mm -hmm. skills to be able to succeed in life and so on. So what that represents is it represents how much we're going to be spending on the, the various levels of education. So nursery for the little children, primary, secondary and university. Mm -hmm. And it includes the various programs that we're implementing in education. Mm -hmm. um, include some of which are the ongoing operations of government so we pay our teachers for example yeah, out do. of that amount we maintain our schools now with the covid uh, uh, environment we're sanitize we're projecting that we'll need to sanitize the schools more make sure that schools are safe for children um, but then of course we also have a number of new initi initiatives that we're proposing including things like uh, developing our online capabilities. So you I know, know that, that one billion. I see you put a billion dollars in the budget. That's yeah. right. So we yes. have a billion dollars for the online scholarships, which we're going to be providing mm -hmm. for thousands of young Guyanese people, mm -hmm. young and not so young Guyanese people. We have things like delivering education through online means, things like the learning channel yes. that we're going to be rolling right. out, so that you can get educational content at home. As you know, all of our schools schools are not reopened at all levels. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're still delivering a lot of content through the, the, the learning channel for people to be able to still benefit from, people's children still benefit from, from some educational content even if they're still at, home, mm -hmm. still at home. So that represents the total amount that we're going to be spending on education. Okay. Um, uh, this year i want to ask a question about the health sector i've noticed and we got some bullet points so you might see me gazing off a little bit <laughs> sure, sure. in the health sector speaking about covid 19 you have secured in the budget um i guess this is going to come up for debate later on sure. 53 billion 53.5 billion dollars right. for um health sector everything from top to bottom right. however in this you you pinpointed that you want to spend 750 million dollars wholly and solely to deal with covid 19 relief Right. Now, that includes vaccinations and I guess the people that have to go out and vaccinate the people that need to be vaccinated. From the minister's standpoint, I know you're not the minister of health, but you must have had some sort of sure. conversation with him in regards to this. How, how are we going to approach this on a national uh, from a national standpoint? Sure. So it's a very good question that you ask because this is not, it's not, a, it's, it's not a trivial matter. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely correct to identify that it's actually a really complex issue. So it's not just acquisition of vaccines. Mm -hmm. You will note, in fact, that in the budget speech, I, I use the language that suggests not just for acquisition, of, but essentially to roll out the vaccination yes. program. Because it includes acquiring the vaccines, but you have to acquire the vaccines. You have to store the vaccines under very careful conditions. Mm -hmm. In fact, depending on which vaccine you have, there's some special storage conditions including keeping them at particular temperatures mm -hmm. correct to, yeah, we saw that. To, to maintain their um their 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 i guess potency would be mm -hmm. the right word um transporting them under certain conditions so you i mean we have to ensure that we have in place the appropriate storage and transport capabilities and then of course we have to ensure that we are able we have people who are properly trained to administer the vaccine of course so you're absolutely right that this is not i mean a lot of thought had to go into the entire process mm -hmm. the process of landing acquiring landing transporting storage and then deployment administering and we we did put quite a lot of thought both at the ministry of health and the ministry of finance but we did put quite a lot of thought in that entire uh Ch uh, a chain, I guess you could call it, mm -hmm. right? I, wouldn't, I don't want to call it supply chain management, but that that entire uh, sequence of events that mm -hmm. would be involved that need to in, occur in order for this to, to happen. ensure right. the safe and effective deployment of the vaccines. You would have seen that we've actually already started to receive some vaccines. Yes, yes. I saw that. So just last week, some we're also in addition to vaccines that we anticipate we will need to acquire. We're also, of course, because they're quite expensive. We're also trying to work with as many of our bilateral and multilateral partners 
who are willing to donate vaccines. So you've seen quite a few countries who yes, said they're they willing have. to donate. A first va- a admittedly small batch of vaccines, but a first batch of vaccines uh, was received last week, which we've started to deploy to frontline professionals. This is particularly in the, in, in the medical field. Mm-hmm. So you might have seen that doctors have already started to receive the vaccines. They're on the front line, they're in the wards, they're interfacing with patients every day. Yes. They're exposed. It's very important that we protect them. It's very important to be ensured that they're taken care of. So we've started to, de- to deploy these vaccines to frontline professionals. Mm-hmm. We expect a second batch to be coming in about another two weeks' time towards the end of, I guess, the end of February, yeah. when we're going to be rolling it out uh, even further. But you're absolutely correct that this is you know, something that has to be thought of very carefully, which we put a lot of thought in, in, into. In, in determining what would be involved and what would be needed and what we'd need to find out. What, so, <laughs> what, sorry, my <laughs> That's apologies. Okay. That's okay. Where would, where would the politicians fall in line I was of actually gonna ask receiving that the vaccine? Yeah. And are you, are you, you, know, are you as, as anxious to receive the vaccine as I am? Well, the, the politicians are definitely not going to be forced to, <laughs> forced to lie. I now, think a lot of people are probably happy to hear that. I, I, you know, I can certainly confirm that I have not received the vaccine. <laughs> Just so you all know. Um, the politicians are not going to be forced in line. We have said very clearly that the first priority is to protect our healthcare professionals, our okay. frontline professionals. Now, you having said that the politicians will not be front, uh, at the front of the line, and that's I think perfectly appropriate. It's important that the doctors and nurses do get the vaccines. Yeah. I do think too that there's a lot of public debate um, about the vaccines. And I mean, and this, is. Is a, this is a global thing. You know, there's yes. some people are saying, we all want to be protected from COVID. I, would like, I would like to be protected from COVID so I can, Today. So can walk around and not be worried <laughs> yes, about you know, this constant paranoia about what I'm inhaling and what I'm touching and so on. Everybody mm-hmm. wants, to develop some deg- wants to develop an immunity. Yes. But as you know, vaccination is still at its relatively early stages globally. There's a lot of debate about you know, um, whether to take the vaccine or not and what the side effects might be uh, uh, or not. Our position is that once the vaccine is tested and is proven to be uh, effective and, you know, we're only going to be administering vaccines that are well tested and proven uh, to be effective, then we think it's a, it's a good thing, but it's a choice that people are going to have to make. And, you know, you ask about politicians taking the vaccine. Um, I'm perfectly happy for the doctors, doctors <laughs> and nurses to take the vaccine for us. But then- at some point in time, we need to think about, because it's important that it's also important that leaders take a stand to send a signal to people. Yeah, you as have well. to send a message. Absolutely. And so if I display hesitancy to take the then vaccine, then I will display hesitancy. Then it's to take perfectly the natural for you to start to think, hang on a second, if he doesn't, he's, if he's not sure. You're going to become a, a skeptic. Whether to take the vaccine yeah, or not. It's natural for people to start to think, hang on a second. So I'm going to ask you an insider, an insider question now, like, you know, in the fold. I can't promise you. I'll, I can't promise. <laughs> I can't promise you. I'll answer it. But let me hear the que- let me hear the question. In the fold, yeah. are, are there uh, are there some skeptics in the fold in Look, regards to the vaccine? I, I I don't want to speak for other people, but I will say that there are a lot of people in in the in the leadership of government who are also like everybody else in Guyana. There are a lot of people in government who are looking forward to receiving the vaccine so that they can enjoy some degree of protection from COVID-19. I like I can, that politician I tell you answer. That definitively. I like that politician All right, so answer. Let's talk more about the health sector. So the money allocated um, for the health sector, the $53.5 billion, some of it is going to be spent on maternal and child health. And then some of it is going to be enhancing the health services throughout the country. Can you just touch on that? Sure. And, and what that means exactly. Sure. So two things. You ask about maternal and child mm-hmm. health, and this is a very, very important issue. Some years ago, when I was in government previously, in those days, we were pursuing the Millennium Development Goals. Mm-hmm. And one of the, M- some of your listeners would be familiar with what's called the MDGs. These mm-hmm. are goals that the global community had set itself. And one of the goals that Guyana at that stage had uh, quite a lot of work to do to catch up on was maternal and child child health. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, we had developed a special plan for accelerated action to improve the quality of maternal and child health indicators. We all want to know that mothers can uh, go through their, or expectant mothers can go through their pregnancy safely, can give birth to their child safely, they can have a healthy baby, that their baby can grow up healthily. 
And so, and that's very important. That's 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 at the core of human existence. And so, you know, making sure that we, you know, we, we bring into this world healthy babies and they're able to, to enjoy, you know, strong and healthy lives. Mm -hmm. And so we had, at that time, we had developed a plan. Then, of course, we, le we left office. We're back now. We've put back on the, at the top of the agenda, maternal and child health. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see we're, we've dedicated resources to developing to improving the capabilities of hospitals throughout the country mm -hmm. for dealing with maternal and maternal and not and, just and, here in Georgetown, not just here in Georgetown, or region four, not mm -hmm. just here in Georgetown, not just here in region four. So even in the regional hospitals mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in Barbies, in West Demerara, in Linden, we want to develop, we want the hospitals to be better able to take care of expected mothers, new mothers and their newborn babies. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, we're actually looking at the possibility, and it's mentioned in the budget speech, we're looking at the possibility of setting up a specialist maternal and child, I read that. He, child hospital. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, that's definitely needed here. Yeah, yeah so without it's, a doubt. It's something that we're looking at. And then you mentioned rolling out healthcare across the country. You know, Guyana is a vast country. Mm -hmm. And we must, those of us who have traveled, those of us who have had the privilege to travel through Guyana, know the vastness of the country, but also know the remoteness of some of our communities. We don't, as a government, enjoy the luxury of saying remoteness is an excuse for not delivering basic services. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Even in the most distant village. You have villages in Guyana where you have to fly for two hours. You have to go. Then you have to drive for another three hours. Then you probably have to take a boat for another two hours to get to those villages. Mm -hmm. But those villages are populated by people who are Guyanese. That's right. Those are Guyanese people living in a village in Guyana. And we have a responsibility as a government to ensure that they enjoy basic social services at the minimum. And we've committed to that. So we want to make sure that we're able to deliver basic health care throughout the length and breadth of the country. Now, of course, you can't build a top of the line, full fledged hospital in every single village, especially where there is a relatively modest population. Mm -hmm. Right. But we want to be able to make sure that we're able to deliver at least the most basic of primary health care throughout Guyana. Good supportive system. Absolutely. So we're looking at ensuring that there's a properly equipped and properly staffed health center or health hut to serve every village. And then clusters of communities that there are, there's a better equipped medical facility that can deal with you know, intermediate medical problems and issues mm -hmm. and then that we have enough systems in place that people can then be brought to a better equipped hospital if they have medical if complications okay. if, uh, absolutely and so our intention is to roll out the healthcare system ensure that good quality medical care is available to everybody wherever they are fair enough okay within wanna... within like balancing the realities of our population distribution and and, and dispersion of people and so on let's gotcha. talk about the big big number 383.1 billion now, in your, in your synopsis, it's dubbed the largest budget in Guyana's history. Tell right. me about that. Right. So, you know, there, there are a couple of things that I would want to say about that. One, people want services. People want good hospitals. They want good schools. They want their road to be built. They want new roads to be built. They want new land to be opened. They want the hinterland airstrips to be repaired. They want good services. They want good infrastructure, good services. There's a lot of pressure for you to build every road, build every bridge, build every school, build every hospital, uh, you know, pay people better. So there's constant pressure on government expenditure. And so if we were to meet all of the needs, if we were to meet all of the demands, the truth is the budget would probably be much bigger. Mm -hmm. But in but this budget, on the other you hand, also said there was no new taxes. Absolutely. You know where I'm going with this. You know where I'm going with this. <laughs> on the other hand, the reality is that the budget has to be financed. You have to be raising money to finance the budget. Mm -hmm. And particularly in an economy where you want to incentivize growth, which we want to do, you don't want to be taxing people too heavily so, because you want businesses and households to be able to retain their income, reinvest their income, save their incomes, etc. And so we have to strike a balance between how much we spend on the expenditure side and how much we tax people to raise revenue to finance the budget. So what is significant about the, th the 383 billion is that it represents a significant growth on previous budgets. It's the largest budget ever. 
but it is financed without the introduction of any new taxes. In fact, quite the opposite. We're actually reducing taxes. You've seen, you'd see that we've reduced VAT. Mm -hmm. We've um, reduced VAT to the zero rate mm -hmm. on, a mm -hmm. of, on a number of items. We've reduced taxes on a uh, number of construction materials because we want everybody to be able to own, everybody wants to own Removal of that data everyone, for residential everyone. and Ab individual use. In today's world, we're all walking around with our telephones. We have it in our, our hands. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So what is significant about the $383 billion is not only that it delivers more to the people of Guyana, but it does so without taxing them heavily. Okay. And then there is a third layer that I would add. To the extent that your expenditure is greater than your revenue, mm -hmm. you have what is called a budget deficit mm -hmm. I'm because you're spending more than you're collecting. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're spending more than you're collecting, then you're incurring what's called a budget deficit. We have a budget deficit this year and we've had as a country a budget deficit for many years. How do you finance that deficit? You finance that deficit by borrowing. However, what you don't want to do is you don't want to borrow at a level that you will not be able to afford to pay in the future. Because they will okay. own you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we all, everybody listening to your program right now, they are managing a budget too. Correct. We're all managing budgets. In all of our homes, we are managing budgets. Some might be smaller than others. <laughs> absolutely. But right. the reality is, even a person on the most modest of incomes, any one of us, we know how much we earn every month. We mm -hmm. know how much we can spend. We know how much we're spending. And we know if we spend more than what we're earning. We have to wait till next month. Absolutely. Yes. Or we will be eating into what we had saved last month, or we'll be borrowing from somebody who we have to pay back next month. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. And what you don't want to do is incur such a big deficit or spend so much more than what you're collecting to the extent that you end up borrowing more than you will be able to repay. Okay. Fair enough. And so we need to make sure, as we have done here, we have made sure that we don't borrow at a level that will be unsustainable into the future. Okay. Because the truth is that we need to invest now and we need to spend now, but we don't want future generations to be straddled with a burden of debt mm -hmm. that is not sustainable, that is not manageable. Well said. So we need to balance all of those bits. So I'm glad that you highlighted the size of the budget. Mm -hmm. It's delivering more to the people of Guyana, but it's delivering more to the people of Guyana without taxing them more. In fact, we're taxing them less mm -hmm. and without borrowing excessively so that they will not be straddled with unsustainable debt. In the so future. how does a poor man like me, a, body, a, a person that gets up at six in the morning and works until six in the evening, to make everything work out, you know, to balance my budget. How are we affected by this new budget? And what are some of the things that you, you know, you might have hidden away in the text that is going to help us to come up to well, scratch? Well, you're affected, you're, you're, you're affected and your life is influenced in many, many ways, many, many ways. First of all, directly, some of the measures that we've implemented, you pay, I presume you pay for the water that you consume in your home. You pay for the telephone and the data that you have on the very nice telephone that you <laughs> have there. <laughs> right? You're paying for data on that phone. You're paying for water. Mm -hmm. Immediately, your water bill is going to be less and your telephone bill is going to be less because you're not going to be paying for data anymore. So immediately, you have a couple of dollars more in, of disposable income right away. So that's point number one. Mm -hmm. Point number two is you're a working man, just like everybody else, just like most other people. Mm -hmm. You're constantly looking for opportunities to work. Yes. To the extent that people are going to come to Guyana, invest, set up new operations, set up new businesses. You have, as an, as an employee, as, an, as an, a person who works, you have an opportunity now to compete in a market that is bigger, that is growing. There are more opportunities to work. There are more opportunities to do business. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're running a radio program, to the extent that the economy does well mm -hmm. and businesses do well and businesses are participating in this growing economy, they'd be more willing to advertise, they'd be more willing to sponsor more programs, your program will do well. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm speaking here to you, Mr. Casual, yeah, running a radio program, but the same thing applies to anybody else. Yes. The same thing applies to somebody running a little biz, a small business out there. The same thing applies to somebody running a big business out there. To the extent that the economy is growing, Business is better for all of us. Life is better for all of us. Job opportunities uh, will arise. And then, if you're a person who has a child who goes to school, chances are the school will be delivering 
hopefully better quality service or progressively better quality service. Fair enough. And so that affects you. And too. there's now a grant for the kids too, right? At $15,000. Now, now we have introduced the grant. We have introduced a grant, a cash grant mm -hmm. to every school child. I every need child. That. I need that. $15,000. I got two kids, by the way. It, to, the, <laughs> to the extent that your children exactly. are going to school, the, every child will get a fifth. The parents of every child will get a $15,000 grant. Mm -hmm. Just to give you one example. Yes. If you have elderly parents, their old age parents, Pension has gone up yes, to twenty five thousand. Mm -hmm. If you have relatives who are receiving this um, this uh, public assistance for people who have chronic difficulties uh, or in, are in very challenged circumstances, the public assistance grant has, has gone up to particularly vulnerable communities. So, little in every respect, if you're if you're a person who's looking to to build a home, the cost of constructing your home has gone down. If you're a person renting a home the dynamics in the home ownership market and the ho rental market will change because the cost of construction is going down. Mm -hmm. People are better able now to go to the bank to and borrow, get a loan, to get a, lo a, a, a loan to build a home. So literally every aspect of your life and an economy that's growing, generally people spend more, uh, there's more income circulating in the economy and we all do well. You know, there's an old saying, there's an old saying it's a little bit overused now. It's a little bit cliched now, but there's an old saying that a rising tide lifts all boats. I'll buy that. <laughs> yeah. no, I'll buy You're that. that wrong? I will buy that. We, we all have. I understand it. So, I, was, so wait, I just wait, want to touch wait. on before, before you ask him this difficult okay. question, right? I want to ask you something that you must have seen, right? Yep. Now, you're the Minister of Finance. You have to come from home to the office every day. You probably take two routes, one in and out. You must have seen, um, this is what I've seen. A lot of people setting up shops and food outlets in, in different spaces around the city and yeah. probably out on the outskirts of town as well. Does that affect us by saying um, we have to, a lot, a lot more people are now going out there and looking for things to do? Or does it affect us by saying our economy is growing? Look at how many more people are creating jobs for themselves. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, look, I. I think it's a very positive thing when people are going out and trying to set up small businesses and mm -hmm. trying to earn a living. I think it's a, it's a very positive thing. And I think more people should be encouraged to think as entrepreneurs, to think about, you know, setting up a business. And, you know, a lot of us grow up in a very conventional environment. You believe you go, you grow up in an environment where you're supposed to go to school. Mm -hmm. You, you f finish school, you get a job. You work, you, family, you work hard, you get a promotion. You work harder, you get another promotion. You move up the ladder. You move up the ladder, and that is life as you know it. That's a, like a sort of orthodox path that most, that m many young people, it's a very traditional path that many of us are brought up to, to believe is the natural path that we all have to traverse in life. We are not, I think traditionally, we are not taught to be risk takers. We're not taught to be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to knock the traditional path. I think a lot of us will just go to school and do well at school and go and get a job. And that's a good thing. And there's always going to be demand for that. But I think people also need to think about alternative paths in life. And entrepreneurship, setting up small businesses is something that we actually think is really good for the economy. I just want to cut you. So is that why you, uh, the budget has dedicated the allocation of $250 million for micro businesses to Abs aid in their growth? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because th the truth is that the small businesses of today are the medium and big yeah, and large grow. size businesses they will of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is not all businesses will become big businesses. Some will be small businesses and will continue to earn you a pretty decent living and mm -hmm. they're not going to become big mega businesses. But every big business that you see today started as a small, started business. As a small business. Like and Drake said, started from the bottom, now we're here. Uh, everybody, <laughs> there are so many examples mm -hmm. of huge businesses that started in somebody's garage or border market or border market. E-Networks is actually a prime example of that. There are very s couple of employees at the beginning and now a larger business. Absolutely. Yeah. Every big business that you can think of today started literally as a stall in border market 
or a stall in Starbrook Market or somebody tinkering in their garage mm -hmm. or somebody tinkering in the bottom house of their, of their, or their backyard. Mm -hmm. Every big business that you look around, without exception, look around and you will see. Mr. Singh, you're the financial brain of our country. You're the one that, that, that points us in the direction of investments and, and windfalls for our nation. Um, are you burdened? by this budget do you dream of numbers <laughs> you must dream about numbers because michael jackson could see music so do you see numbers I, all the time I, I, I wherever I, you go i can't confess i can't <laughs> confess i wish if i could i wish if i could truthfully confess to dreaming of numbers i must admit i don't dream well, of that's numbers. Good. that's good that's good that's good to know but, but you know you, you casual you ask a very interesting question am i am i burdened by this i will say this that just like you enjoy what you do and you know that you're providing a service to the people who listen to you, you're entertaining them, you're keeping them engaged, they're, you know that you're exciting them and mm -hmm. you know they're enjoying what they're listening to. I like what I do. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's a huge privilege to be, to be doing something that I think is good for my country. It's a huge privilege. It's a great honor and a great privilege. And I like doing it. And so I, 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 I couldn't say that it is in the least bit a burden. I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to describe it as, as, as burdensome. Mm -hmm. To the extent that, and, and, I, and I, I do believe that I am, to the extent that I'm doing something that is useful to the country. And you know, because I've done this before, I, I saw how Guyana changed over the, the two terms that I served previously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't fix every problem. We didn't solve every issue, but we made a lot of progress. Okay. And you feel, it's a very good feeling when you look back and you see how the country has changed in a positive way. And from my previous term of office, I, I, I will say that I'm immensely proud of what we achieved as a country. Not solely as a government. I mean, as a government, we created the right conditions. But the people of Ghana responded to those conditions, invested, set up their businesses, grew. And at the end of my previous term in office, I was very, very happy and proud to see where we, the progress that we had made as a country. And I would say the same now that I think it's, this is really, it's not, you know, I've always been at pains to say, we're not in, we're not on easy street. Not yet. We're not on easy street. And you know, the truth is that it's still going to take a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. But th as I said in the budget speech, and as I will say this afternoon, we really are at a position right now where Guyana has remarkable opportunities before us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we have the right set of policies and we make the right strategic investments to transform the country and we facilitate large-scale and not so large-scale private investment, big investors, but also small businesses, I think we could see a really, really exciting, remarkable transformation in Guyana. And to be afforded an opportunity to play a part in that process, I think is a huge privilege. Well said. Okay. So just one quick question for, from me, because we've had the Minister of Culture, Youth and Sport on several times. Right. And I know that there's going to be 1.5 billion set aside for sport. We have a lot of people watching that love sports, that are interested in playing sports, that maybe haven't had the, you know, the uh, infrastructure available to them right. uh, quite yet. So I know there's going to be sporting facilities set up in regions 2, 6, and 10. And 320 million has been budgeted towards the professional training of athletes and coaches why this amount and why 1.5 billion for sport well you know I'll t here again we want every single guy in this person to be able to realize their potential mm -hmm. now some of us are going to be musicians some of us are going to be doctors some of us are going to be engineers one of us is going to be finance minister <laughs> one of us is going to be finance minister some of us will be farmers mm -hmm. some of us will be mechanics some of us will be cricketers, some of us will be boxers, and we want everybody able to be able to do what they do as well as they possibly can. We want to create a Ghana where people can realize their potentials, they're, 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 they're the fullest of their potential. Right. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that we have a lot of people with remarkable talent in Guyana. 
some in sport. We've had some really fun people, fantastic sporting Ram ability. Never saw one. Mm -hmm. In cricket mm -hmm. and in so many other sports that you boxing. can think of, boxing, boxing football, track and field. You know, we still have we Guyana. We still have the distinction that boxing is the only field in which we've had we've had a we've won an Olympic yes uh, an Olympic medal and a world and, championship and a world and we've had I think more than one world champions mm -hmm. um, in boxing in the various uh, weight categories. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people with a lot of potential. And we need to create and we want as a government to create conditions where people can realize this potential. So look, some of us are good sportsmen, we're good footballers, and we want to create a condition where you can realize the fullest of your potential. And one of these days, we want to be able to, one of these days in the not so distant future, we want to be churning out world-class athletes. Mm -hmm. Of course. Whether you're footballers, whether you're boxers, whether you're cricketers, whether you're tennis players, whatever. We want to be able to produce world-class athletes okay. in every discipline. Excellent. We want to be able to produce world-class world -class musicians. Yes. Mm -hmm. So cultivating culture and the, and the creative arts. Mm -hmm. we, want, we have produced some very good artists, but mm -hmm. we want to create an environment where people can realize their creative potential. Mm -hmm. Artists and sculptors and painters and... Um, and uh, and, uh, and, and radio uh, personalities and, and radio personalities and <laughs> and, and, um, and uh, what do you call it authors yes. writing and poets and so on mm -hmm. we want to create conditions where people can realize the fullest of their potential understood from a financial standpoint from the man behind the numbers this afternoon this is my final question to you where do you see Diana now that we've have uh, new oil wealth I know that you factored it into the budget for the projected gross earnings of our nation heading into the future but um do you think we're in good standings do you think that we're, we're in a good position in the world right now or are we starting to you know can we puff our chest just yet you you you, you know i will i'm i'm not a chest puffing type i'm, I'm not a, I'm, i must admit i'm not a chest puffing type you're more of a humble man i i i yes, I, yes. I, I, I try my best to be so i i wouldn't suggest that anybody walks around <laughs> puffing their chest right but but I will say this, that we should consider ourselves very fortunate in Guyana. You know, sometimes we are very harsh on ourselves. You know, we tend, we tend to, to be very, we tend to beat up on ourselves a, a, a lot. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't reflect enough on what we have. Fair enough. And the truth is that we have a lot in Guyana to be very positive about. And I will mention just a couple of the things that I feel we have so much to be positive about. First of all, I'll mention probably three things. Mm -hmm. First of all, we don't, thankfully, we don't so far have challenges with major natural disasters. No. God, so is, a, God is a Guyanese. We, 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 God was a Trini, now he's a Guyanese. <laughs> we, we, we've been very lucky that we don't have that kind of problem. No, we yeah. don't. Occasionally, we have a little earth Earthquake, tremor. Or it might, things might shake up a little bit or a flood. <laughs> I mean, we have had devastating floods, but they don't come too often. Mm -hmm. So in terms of exposure to natural disaster, natural catastrophe of that sort, we're very lucky. Secondly, we have a remarkable endowment of natural resources and natural I assets. always say this. Minerals. Look at the oil wealth that has now been discovered, but not only that oil wealth. Gold, gold bauxite, bauxite mm -hmm. diamonds. Mm -hmm a remarkable, pristine, intact rainforest, which is itself a vast resource. Water, the, the water, 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 water. Yes. And then very the, important. the aesthetic side of this. Oh, we're beautiful. The, the beauty of the country. Mm -hmm. What would you say is your favorite part of Guyana to actually look at? It's, Wake up in the morning. There are many, it. there are many. It would be hard to say. You know, I mean, <laughs> you can't could, pick one. no, no, it would be hard to say. I mean, I could give you all sorts of the traditional sort of hinterland. I mean, I've, I've, I've been fortunate that I've been able to travel a little bit in the hinterland and there's some spectacularly beautiful uh, places in the hinterland mm -hmm. but even on the coast there are lots of very very beautiful places to visit and historic places to see and so on sometimes we don't quite we don't quite you know appreciate them you know we don't quite understand the what we have mm -hmm. so the not the beauty of the country i think is our i would say our en our endowment of natural resources and even on the aesthetic side a really phenomenally beautiful country yes and a wealthy country in terms of the resources that we have. So oil is one, but mm -hmm. oil is not the only one. And then thirdly and finally, I don't think we fully appreciate the richness of the people, the diversity 
Would you say that that's uh, our best resource? I people? think, I absolutely. I think without a doubt, the people of Guyana are our best resource. And you know, Agreed. We, we underestimate how lucky we are to be such a diverse, such a beautifully diverse people living in harmony. Never mind what some people may want to tell you. Off and on. People in uh, occasionally, maybe, you know, on and off. At the a little rough here and you here. Might have, out. But the overwhelming majority of Guyanese people, the overwhelming, and this has always been my experience throughout my life, mm -hmm. the overwhelming majority of Guyanese people live very harmoniously, they do. very happily with each other. They don't see issues of race. They don't see issues of religion. religion. They don't, nobody, nobody asks or cares what religion you are or i mean the truth is you and i see every day people interacting of every race and of muslims every religion and hindus muslims celebrating and Christians. celebrating each, each other's, other's holiday, culture yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes celebrating each other's there's no concept of festivals that are uniquely hindu festivals Correct. that non-hindus don't celebrate Correct. there's no concept of christian festivals that non-christian guyanese don't celebrate mm -hmm. eating each other's food Mm -hmm. and enjoying it as your own yes mm -hmm. there's no concept that you know this set of food belongs to one ethnicity agreed, and that agreed. set belongs to another every day we enjoy the richness of our diversity without even thinking about it enjoying each other's music enjoying each other's literature enjoying each other's religious ceremonies every day we do it without thinking we take it for granted we do we take it for granted we don't think about it you know, we interact and socialize with people of different backgrounds. We don't think about it, but it's a beautiful diversity that is a remarkable strength. Well said. And I feel very strongly about that. And so, I, I mean, when you speak about whether we are a lucky or a fortunate country, you know, I think, I think we are in so many ways. The oil is one mm -hmm. part of it, but the oil is really just a small part Agreed. Of, of the story. Agreed. I think that we have a lot to be very proud of and a lot to be very happy about. How soon can we see implementation of the budget once it has been passed in Parliament? Can we start seeing things start developing absolutely, and moving? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we are going to be, the debates will start, I think, on the 22nd, Monday coming. Yes. It should take us a couple of weeks or so, but once we get out of Parliament, implementation will start and then run through the whole of the year. There we go. Money going to be spent. <laughs> Things going to change for the good. This is a good look. Man. And you know, I will say this, every single Guyanese person has a role to play in making Guyana a better place. Agreed. You know, this GDP number that I talk about is aggregate production, mm -hmm. aggregate output by people. Yes. Mm -hmm. And each one of us, whether you're doing entertainment, whether you're a musician, whether you're a farmer, whether you're a miner, mm -hmm. you're contributing to production in the economy. Whether you're a bus driver, whether you're a truck driver, whether you're a, a nurse, a nurse mm -hmm. or a doctor, or a, preacher, a lawyer, a mm -hmm. you're contributing to production in the country. And I've, I always say to people, whatever it is that you do, please make sure that you do it well. Because your country, you know, we all want Ghana to be a better place. Everybody has a role to play in making sure that you deliver quality service. If you are a bartender mixing drinks for people, do a great job and you're sending a good signal about Ghana being a better place. If you're driving a car, drive it carefully and drive it well, and you're sending a signal about Ghana being a safer and better place. If you're a doctor, be a good doctor. If you're a DJ, be a great DJ and entertain your audience well and you're making a contribution to Ghana being a better place. Each one of us. There's no, I, I, I reject completely this concept that the responsibility for making Ghana a better place is somehow the task of the government leaders or the task of the government. The task of making Ghana a better place is everybody's responsibility. We all have a role to play. And whatever it is that we do, we should do it as well as we can, and we should aspire to do it better Every day, ladies and Every gentlemen, days that goes by. The man Excellent. behind the numbers. The man behind the, the man numbers. Behind the numbers. Thank you so much for stopping by today. We have definitely gone over our time, but it was an enjoyable conversation. I think we learned a lot today. Great I talk. still have quite a few questions, but we'll do that another day. How do people get an opportunity to ask questions to the the Minister of Finance? Is that yeah. is that possible for citizens to have those um, those interactions? Well, with I mean, I we do spend a lot of time going out, so I do spend a lot of time you know, visiting communities and going to different places. But of course, that's a very focused, uh, that's a very focused uh, audience. It's, you know, wherever I go, uh, I speak with people there. I mean, I do have 
fairly regular media engagements. I speak, I have a complete, like everybody else in the government, I have a, an open engagement with the media. I speak with, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't schedule press conferences once every month. I literally, anybody in the media who wants to speak to me pretty much has access to me. Does um, the ministry have a Facebook page? We do have a social media okay. presence. What's your social okay. media presence? So there is a Ministry of Finance guy on a page on the face on Facebook, which mm-hmm. okay. we're able to, which anybody can access, and they can okay, interact perfect. with that and page they too. And they can send their questions, post things, or send questions. Okay, and, perfect. And I, I I have a team of people in. I mean, I see it, but I'm I don't literally answer every question myself. Do you have people responsible? Have for that. You have a team. I have a team, and there are some things that are brought to my attention. We don't people. expect you to, to respond to every Facebook no. question. But we do have a social media presence, and it's a, it's a growing presence, and it's uh, you know increasing. We live in the age of social media. Yes, and we today, do. Today, a lot, particularly young people, that's their that's the the what do you call it? That's the go to place yes. for information. <laughs> that's where it is. They, it definitely is. But it's been a great pleasure being here. Thank you very much for inviting me, and I'd be happy to come again. Yes, we, we I still time. have a lot of questions because well, uh, I, I guess, did my research. So I guess now we have to wait until the, the budget passes, and then we'll so be able after, to right. So that's, a, that's ask a, you. You know, how after can that, we we'll have you in? come back on and very then good. finish off the conversation. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, yes. thanks for being a part of the show, and keep keep up the great work that you're doing too. Me well, my friend. Thank you very much. Remix, you want to say anything to the people before we go? No. I just want to thank the minister once again for stopping by. I think it was a very enjoyable, informative conversation, and we very much appreciate it. We know he's a busy man, especially now at this time. So thank you, minister, for um, stopping by the number one radio station in all of Guyana. In the world. In the, oh, in the world. Okay, I forgot we're, that part. My bad. We're out. Okay, bye.